Hello, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce my colleague, Una Kim. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the Pagels Memorial Lectures. Heinz Pagels is a very distinguished physicist. He was a president of New York Academy of Sciences. He was a he was a trustee of Aspen Institute. He spent 20 years as a member of uh, Aspen Center for Physics. And um, very first year I came here in 1988 is uh, when uh, we had a, an accident climbing Pyramid, Pyramid Peak. And uh, he was a very, Extremely in uh, number, but you know, pyramid is not living. Um, so this was very tragic. This was my first year in Aspen. And I have been coming here for the last 40 years now, maybe something like that. And I have been uh, very fortunate to attend almost every summer. The, and I'm really very fond of this place. I'm sure you all know that. Um, so what more I can tell you about uh, Heinz Pagels. Um, Heinz was, uh, not only was a uh, physicist and a member of the Aspen Center for Physics, but he was very distinguished physicist, as I said before. And um, he also was very, you know, important person developing ideas of chaos and to such an extent that, you know, you have seen the movie Jurassic Park, maybe some of you, and um, it was sort of inspired, the chaos aspect of that was inspired by Spiegel's work. So, you know, I think that that I would say a little bit about Una Kim and the then I will, um, anything wrong? You can hold the mic a little closer. Oh, sir. Um, I don't want to repeat this, do I? No. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, so Una is a very distinguished, uh, accomplished physicist. She graduated from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, then was a postdoc at uh, Stanford, and from there she went to Cornell as a professor. And uh, she is going to, she is attending the workshop here today, uh, this week. And um, basically that he would, is a very intriguing title. I hope to learn from what she has to say about this. And there's also a demonstration with that. So with, Further ado, I think I'm going to get Una started. I mean, there was one time when I was introducing a very famous Nobel laureate here in Aspen. He, uh, I went on too long and he turned to me and said, no, he didn't come here to listen to you. But they came to listen to me. <laughs> so, so I don't say much, much anymore about introdu introducing people anymore. So that I'm going to hand this over to Una and she will take you through this journey. Right. Well, thank you. And um, I'm honored to be here. And thank you all for coming on this beautiful day. Um, I am going to talk about machine learning sociology in the quantum realm. Um, I want to start by showing a quantum, uh, showing a social phenomena. Uh, okay, here's an example of a social phenomena. Now, um, this is social phenomena at a much larger scale than what I want to talk about. Now, if you look at each of their hands or in the pocket, there's a phone, most likely. <laughs> and inside the phone are atoms and electrons. And that electron has spin. So, um, these electrons as a community also form societies. 
Here are examples of two very different societies, electrons form. Now, how many of you see the top uh, material be dull compared to the lower one? How many of you think the top is duller? Thank you. <laughs> dull, dull meaning like less shiny. <laughs> Sorry, this was very engineered. Okay, so why does it look dull? It looks dull because the electrons in this material at room temperature, this picture is taken at room temperature, and at room temperature, they, they are in this very disorganized and chaotic state. That's reflected in the ways that we can see as looking very dull. However, if you take this society and change the conditions by lowering the temperature, you can go to this very different state, this very uh, coherent, orderly state, which we call superconductor. Now, what about this uh, material over here? That is not a superconductor, nor is it a poor conductor, but it is sort of like this. It's a semiconductor. It either conducts or doesn't. But there is nothing in the middle. So understanding these very small societies had tremendous impact on our societies. This is ENIAC of 1949, gigantic room filling, building filling computer. Of course, you know, is less powerful compared to the cell phones that we can hold in our hands. And the reason is because the on-off state that you need to make computers in the time of ENIA was accomplished through vacuum tubes, but um, we invented transistor by understanding semiconductors, Nobel Prize in physics. Um, and nowadays, those uh, transistors are so miniaturized it can be in integrated chips. My colleagues and I are interested in exploring different types of electron societies to get, achieve more interesting, particularly perhaps more useful properties, such as zero heat loss induction. The trouble is, electrons are very small. So on a piece of material that you can hold in your hand, there are trillion, trillion individual electrons. So to herd them, you know how hard it is to herd a group of people to do the same thing? To herd all these electrons to do what we want them to do will be very difficult. We'll have to understand them intimately. So how do we study them intimately? Such a small object. Now, um, how many of you know who this guy is? Okay. Now, um, that man is fiction. And um, at this point, some of my colleagues, physicists who have watched the movie would cringe because it's so wrong. However, that man and we physicists studying quantum matter share one thing in common. We want to understand the quantum realm. We want to understand what it's like in their very small world. But there is no pin particles, which is what Ant-Man drinks to become small. And the real quantum realm is very different. This, this is nothing close. So I want to reward you by giving you a sense of the real quantum realm in a, um, in a way that is very relevant today. So remember that electron in your um, cell phones? Mm -hmm. The electron has this spin. The spin has the property of qubits. And qubits are like, more like beach ball compared to classical bits, which are like switches. So how does qubits being beach ball matter? I actually have a qubit here. Now, first of all, unlike switch, which only has two states, you can imagine says many, many, many states. That already gives you a sense of richness. However, there is this something very peculiar about quantum mechanics, which says, although it might be pointing in a different direction, when you measure, measurement, 
yields only two possible outcomes. It's called projection. So when it is in a head state, no matter how many times you measure, you're going to see the same state. However, the cubic can be in a superposition, which means you will see head or tail with equal probability. That's what superposition means. OK, so well, that was just one qubit. Can, what happens when we have multiple qubits? Now, fortunately, I've invited some qubits, volunteer qubits today here. You, qubits, please come to the stage. I want to demonstrate what's called an entangled state. OK, so now here are my qubits. I'll, I'll come towards the center. OK. OK. Good, all right. So now I'm going to prepare them. All qubits need to be prepared. I'm going to prepare them. Turn around to be prepared. Okay. Now they are all prepared. They are prepared into a state. And I want you to figure out what kind of state that is. Okay. Qubits, turn around. All right. Every time I clap, you get to see a measurement. What have you seen? It looks chaotic. Okay, let, let's try again. This is, let's first start a simple state. Start with a simple state. We're going to prepare head state. Okay. Now, we're going to have another one around. Okay. What did you see? The, the second person or second qubit had a had an error. Good. Okay. What else did you see? There was consistent. There was something consistent. There that is, except for that error, everybody was doing the same thing, right? But was it always the same when I did the measurements? No. It changed between measurements, right? I'll try one more time. Okay. It will be the last time. This is the GHD state. Okay. The error was gone. This was better prepared. Now, what have you seen? All consistent, yes. And you saw head and tail with. How many, what, what kind of frequency? About equal, right? But it was hard to say because you only saw it five times. So out of five measurements, it cannot be quite equal. But, you know, to the best approximation, it looked about equal. So that's finite measurement of what's called GHZ state. GHZ state is multiple qubits all being entangled in a superposition of everybody head and everybody tail, but equal probability. That's what a GHC state is. Okay. Now, um, something that I want you to notice from this demo is that how when there is one error, it made it hard to figure out what was going on, right? And also because we can entangle them or make them work the same way in different configurations. Together, they form much larger set of possibilities compared to six switches or six classical bits, which would just all individually go up or down. Also, you can see perhaps due to these measurements, there could be sense of noise and there is a need for interpreting the measurements. Am I with you? Are you with me? Okay, good. All right, let's thank all the qubits. Thank you. You may. So, um, so that's what a real quantum realm is a little bit like. At least this is much closer than anything you see in the Ant-Man. 
Um, but that was just six qubits or maybe six electrons. How do we understand? How do I have confidence that I know what's going on in the quantum realm when clearly I cannot see these electrons by my eyes? Well, what we do is we take measurements. And when we take measurements, uh, we've been taking measurements for over hundreds of years. My title has something about machine learning. That's going to enter because how the data that we can obtain from measurements are changing. The data-driven challenges. X-ray diffraction in 1913. This is Nobel Prize winning paper uh, by father and son, Bragg and Bragg. And what they tried to understand in this paper were these three peaks. There are three peaks here. And that's what they tried to understand. What, what they're doing is they're shooting X-ray as they tilt up the, the sample and measuring whether the scattered light, scattered X-ray measured at a detector, how strongly it is um, scattering as they change the tilt angle. This paper won Nobel Prize by coming up with the very first successful, what we call forward model. And the model was they thought, well, I, don't, I cannot see the atoms, but let's, uh, let me postulate atoms form these planes, and there is a distance between the plane. And they thought about how the X-ray coming in and reflecting at different planes will what's called interfere. One parameter in that model was the distance between the planes. So with that one parameter, they were able to reproduce the three peaks with a number that seemed sensible. That's how we measure the distance between the atoms in a crystal. This was revolutionary 100 years ago. But today, instead of three peaks, my colleagues can take 100,000 peaks. They can measure with far greater degree of detail. They don't measure at just one angle of plane, they measure at all three angles. So we get this kind of data, and what can we do with this? Projective measurements that I've demonstrated, this was the beginning of quantum mechanics. These two people, um, Stern and Gerlach, uh, um, celebrated in this plaque for their first experiment in 1922, doing the projective measurements on the superposition state of one qubit which is what I demonstrated. Now, today, instead of one qubit, my colleagues can prepare um, hundreds of qubits. Now, these hundreds of qubits will be probed, measured the same way we looked at six qubits. What can you do with this kind of measurement when the states are spanning extremely large set of possibilities? This is where uh, my group and my collaborators have been pushing using machine learning tools to learn from complex data uh, uh, measured of measurements of sort of microscopic properties, as well as the outcomes from quantum simulators. Let me first start by how we use machine learning tools to understand uh, large and complex data. Here is an example of uh, See if I can do this. Good. Okay. So this is a uh, evolution of that large data set as a function of temperature. As you change temperature, this large uh, distribution changes because material properties change. Like I said earlier, how uh, what looks very dull, this ceramic, can become a superconductor when you lower the temperature. So we would like to understand from this large, complex distribution of data where interesting things are happening. And you have a large stack of things and trying to find some rare, interesting object. That's what I found myself doing during COVID. Mm -hmm. I had my kids actually in the audience. Um, and I was frequently requested to find that special piece that they really need from a bin of uh, Lego. And you know, after doing that day after day during COVID, we we're all at home. We quickly discovered picking up one piece and inspecting by eye is this a piece I'm looking for, is not the way to approach this. So what did you do? What, what did we do? Um, without thinking about machine learning, this is what we did. We, we stored it into different types of pieces. Plus around when we were doing this, I was also thinking about large volumes of data. I sort of lived my life in superposition of being a mother and a physicist. 
Mm -hmm. So I get inspirations from uh, working, playing with my kids. We thought maybe we can approach the large volume of x-ray data the way I approach Lego pieces. So what can I do? Well, perhaps because different phenomena occur at different temperatures, by tracking temperature evolution of each of these peaks, 100,000 of them, maybe we can sort their behaviors. So the first thing uh, my collaborators and I did was to plot how those brightness change as a function of temperature for every single one of them. This is an extremely large volume of data and nobody plotted it this way. And um, this is what we got. Um, looks like there's a lot going on and it looks pretty messy. <laughs> but maybe there are some, some trends. Maybe there are some groups that are behaving similarly. Any of you see sort of a different type of groups? Is it somewhat visible? Kind of there, right? So you would like to find how to sort them. So the um, idea we used is the idea now, let's see. Uh, so what you're hearing, what you are hearing was people talking over each other. When you people talk over each other, it's hard to hear what any one person is saying. And if you want to listen to just one person, you would like to be able to separate out just that one person. And there are algorithms for doing that. And we thought this problem, this data problem is very much like that. We used a sort of a very rudimentary version of what's called speaker verification approach called Gaussian mixture model. And this is what we achieved. So does it kind of relate to what you are seeing on the left-hand side, right? So this, what this machine learning tool does is very sensible. It's finding kind of like behaviors, which a human could also find. We had the patience and time, but you know we get tired of looking at something that looks similar for a, a lot of time. So typically we have not been, the community has not been analyzing these data in a comprehensive way. We would look at some samplings and then we would move on to the next data set. Now with this approach that we developed, sort of related to how I was sorting the Lego pieces, which is now implemented at Advanced Photon Source at Argonne National Lab. Uh, experimentalists, my colleagues can um, do, take their measurements and sort their data and focus on interesting parts. So a particular problem that we studied with this approach was this material called uh, adamium renate. It is a material which has the gray uh, balls are cadmium atoms and orange balls are, are rhenium atoms, are equal number of them, and I'm not showing oxygens. This material becomes superconductor at low temperature, but starting from room temperature, it goes through two transitions. And this transition, adding the specific heat, shows a large peak. That's signaling there is something dramatic happening inside. This is one way we know what's going on. But the actual changes in X-ray data I told you how you can use x-ray to find the distance between atoms. Um, the extra changes in the data was very small. So it was really hard to pin down what's going on. My colleagues took eight terabytes of data. In a, in a few minutes, I'll try to give you a sense of what terabytes mean. Eight terabytes is a lot. Running this through our algorithm, we were able to sort this out in about 10 minutes. Afterwards, the results that we got from machines had kind of puzzling new unexpected phenomena and took us two months afterwards trying to make sense out of the results. But the, uh, this approach allowed us to look at the entirety of data and have confidence once we arrive at a conclusion, what we were seeing was really what's going on. What we were able to find was uh, displacement between cadmiums and rhenium's being out of out of sync, um, and the fact that there is this mode of fluctuation between two different structures. But this is just the beginning of how uh, the kind of discoveries that can be accelerated by this approach. Now, what about the quantum simulator data? 
So we were trying to, you all were engaged in trying to decode the projected measurement outcome of the six qubits. And um, characterizing quantum states, as you've exper experienced, is not a trivial matter. If you have a quantum computer like this, mm -hmm. uh, my colleagues will spend a lot of effort preparing it. But the preparation not only has the intended uh, arrangement, there's always an inevi inevitable amount of noise. All you have to, all, all you get to do is to take these measurements like you are seeing and trying to infer from the measurements what could be going on. If you could take infinitely many measurements, you'll be able to figure out exactly what's going on. But we don't have infinitely uh, time to make infinitely many measurements. What do I mean by uh, the space of possibilities being large? What is the challenge? If you have n cube, n q qubit system, the, the number of complex parameters that you have to specify in order to completely characterize it goes like n, four to the n cube. If you have 10 qubits, you have about uh, one megabyte volume of uh, complex parameters that you have to figure out. 20 qubits become one terabyte. 53 qubits become one quintillion terabyte. Trying to figure out what is going on in this system of qubits, it's kind of like trying to read the entire Library of Congress and to figure out what's going on in that entire library. Because the entire Library of Congress, the volume of text there is only 20 terabytes. So this is a challenging problem. And what uh, my colleagues and I thought to do was to uh, take inspirations from the machines that are very good at reading in a lot of information. How many of you have heard of GPT? Okay, how many of you know what P stands for in GPT? T stands for transformer. So transformer is a, a algorithm approach that made all these language models really work. The way it works is to rec by recognizing importance of non-local correlations in the sentence. So here's a sentence, he lives in the White House. You can try to understand each word separately. No matter how well you understand the de dictionary definition of white or dictionary definition of house, unless you start to think about the two words together, you wouldn't be making progress. But once you start to think about two words, white and house together, and then also think about the word he, together with those two words, you immediately know who he is, at least in the United States. So how does transformer works? Transformer works by recognize, representing each of these words, uh, tokens as an element of a vector, x1 through xx. And then it tries to find the pairs of words that needs to be thought together put up by rotating it and trying to find the match, kind of like Rubik's cube. Rotation is the transformations given by what's called Q and K. And um, that inner product, so-called, is giving you what the attention score. But even if you don't know what a matrix is and um, inner product is, all that matters is by looking at a given sentence and reshuffling the words until you find two words that need to be thought together to click to each other is the way how this uh, language model has been very successful. And we thought um, perhaps we can use, we can be inspired by this approach in trying to make sense out of data from the quantum states. And that's what we did in this paper. Just like a uh, transformer would, uh, mechanism would learn this sentence where all the uh, text in the Wikipedia, we thought to learn from these measurements using the attention mechanism. And what we demonstrated in this uh, first paper was nothing but the GHZ state that you are now all familiar with, where everybody's, it, all the spins being head, all the qubits being tail are in superposition. After taking 200,000 measurements, we were able to recover uh, from the measurements taken from the IBM's on a computer, we were able to recover the correct distribution of everybody being head or everybody being um, tail 
of the equal almost 50% probability, but it took a lot of measurement. And all the, all the data points that you're seeing in the middle is a reflection of both uh, errors and noise in the, in the uh, device, as well as uh, imperfection in working with finite uh, volume of data. So then, then does the uh, using quantum simulators or quantum computers always require uh, this kind of approach? Well, it turns out that's not the case. Um, sometimes we can be kind of clever and prepare and program the system in a way that uh, we can, uh, at the expense of using more qubits to represent one bit of information, we can avoid having to do this kind of analysis. That's the third part of uh, research that I want to uh, showcase today, which is programming quantum simulators. And this is what's going to, uh, this is the image that you will see in your program. So in this um, part, I want to talk about how when you prepare these qubits in a very special state, um, you can know what kind of state the qubits are in without needing this kind of large number of measurements and uh, uh, tomography as we experienced. And the goal here was to move towards um, error correctable or protectable uh, representation of bit of information. So here, the goal was to use some number of qubits to represent a special state, not the state that you saw today, which is a GHC state, but a spe state that is very special in a different way. This idea came from first thinking without qubits and uh, such uh, microscopic realization, but more theoretically. So there is this concept of non abelian anions <laughs> which is to say when a, one particle goes around another and comes back to its initial position, or if you follow the trajectory of the particle, uh, one particle braids with another particle. With uh, normal uh, non-anionic particles that we are used to would result in a state that is identical to what you started with. And there it doesn't seem to have anything changes. If you have non abelian anions, the state that you get after one particle going around in full circle is not only very different, um, it's different in a way, it's not even proportional. Um, it's just totally different from the state where this particle did not go around. That's what anions are. So why do we care? Why would we care about anions? Um, apparently, we already have qubits. So why don't you just do quantum computing with them? Well, we already saw today how there will be errors, right? And if you have errors, you would like to be able to detect and correct for it. So um, in order to do computing, you need to be able to um, write information that you need memory. And you also need to be able to operate on the, those informations. Now, if we use these anions, which remember their history, we would write the information by using a set of anions, and we would operate on the information by swapping them. So um, being able to use many qubits, physical qubits, but to represent the bit of information that we want to represent or store using these anionic objects that are somehow encoded in the life of qubits, would allow us to be uh, to encode information in a way that is non-local, therefore safer uh, or er more protected from errors. More specifically, if I encode a bit of information between these two anions, first I will have to be able to make them. If I can encode information between those, those two anions and operate on that information by braiding between two and three, I would have a approach that will be much more robust and trying to encode information on each one of the, uh, the qubits and putting our faith in it. Now, by this point, 
I've been all over the place, right? I talked about spin, I talked about x-ray, I talked about machine learning and qubit and quantum computer, and you know, it's hot and stuffy and you're prepared, you probably had enough. Well, I'm not going to go into um, how we made this happen, but I'm going to just show you a little movie which demonstrates the principles underneath how we made this happen. And once again, in this movie, you see are going to be all classical. And it was made especially for the audience of one, my puzzle-loving daughter. So here, these Lego bricks are qubits, and yellow sticks are coupling between the qubits. Now, in this current state, which is what we call vacuum, each qubit is coupled to how many other qubits? Speak up. Four. Four. Thank you. So in the vacuum state, when there are no anions, no information is encoded, um, every qubit is coupled to four other qubits. This is a state with 10 qubits, but I'm going to just try to represent one bit of information using this 10 qubit system by first creating um, four Ising anions. By removing two bonds, I have created four qubits having only three connections. Everything red should always have three connections. If you find that that being the case, there is an error in the video, which I should fix. Now, how do I move these anions? Whatever has three connections, therefore red are the anions. We move the anions by clinging the sticks, clinging the edges. What you see is that the anion that was at the very right has moved up. They're trying to swap a pair because that's how we will operate on the logical information stored on the entire system. Once the, um, one, one anion has moved up and out of the way, the anion that was on the left is starting to come in. It has a destination. It's going to try to go to the rightmost spot. And this is accomplished by swinging the edges Always, we swing it away from where the anion wants to go. Now that the anion that was on the left has reached its destination, what's been waiting out of the way, we have to find its spot. And now it has uh, the two anions have completed a single swap or a braid. Now this shows what has just happened in front of our eyes, um, different steps. Oh, sorry. Oh my God, now I have to go here. So um, we started with not having any anions in the vacuum. Everybody had four connections. We moved two bonds, four has three connections. Then we started moving them by um, swinging the edges. And uh, without actually moving the qubit themselves, we managed to swap the two anions. Now, um, even classically, it looks the same. Time t equals to eight looks the same as t equals to one because we figured a way to manipulate in a way that it looks this way. Um, if you do this twice, everything will return to where it started. And if you had not been watching the movie, there will not be any way for you to know whether the anions have gone through a double swap or not. So quantum mechanically, when we implement what you are seeing classically and geometrically uh, on a quantum device uh, by Google, we were able to confirm that a state of logical information encoded in 10 qubits, one bit of logical information was um, operated on and switched to uh, switched from head to tail. This is using 10 qubits to represent one logical bit, go from head to tail. Now you might ask, why do you use many qubits to get one bit of information? Well, that's because this can be protected. So um, if you rely on one qubit to represent one bit of information, um, that can always experience error like you saw. But when you use multiple qubits to, to represent one bit of information in this particular way of using anions, 
their information is included non-locally, you can see that these qubits are all apart from each other. And if we have a larger device, we can make it even farther apart. So um, to summarize, I've been talking about how um, my colleagues and I try to understand the society of electrons and quantum objects uh, without having the magic of uh, Marvel, uh, through looking at, uh, through taking a lot of measurements and trying to understand the measurements. And as the uh, complexity and volume of the measurements grow, they're em um, embracing machine learning tools when needed to uh, make a better sense out of these measurements. Specifically, I talked about um, clustering X-ray data, like you would cluster pieces of Lego to accelerate discovery. I talked about using language models like Google Translator uh, to, uh, to characterize quantum simulator data and uh, programming quantum simulators in a very uh, carefully constructed way in order to realize detectable topological qubits. I want to end my talk on um, this note. How many of you have watched this movie? It's a wonderful movie, right? Um, this is a scene where um, human computers, before we had machine computers, there were human computers. There were east wing human computers and west wing human computers. And um, the very first computer, machine computer, IBM 7090, is getting introduced to, uh, to, the, uh, to the building. And that meant these human computers whose job it was to calculate large, many, many, many algebraic calculations to pre predict the trajectory uh, and, uh, and help the NASA navigate their space program were about to lose their jobs. And today we are once again hearing how automation can lead to um, job losses. But this um, group of human computers did Thanks to Dorothy Vaughan's vision was that they promoted themselves from being a computer to programmer. They learned to program the machine that was arriving so that they will not be replaced by the machines because they are programming the machines. And um, this is how uh, I think uh, we should approach these um, the fast developing world of AI as well as quantum simulators. What quantum computers can do uh, and what the machines can do, perhaps what we can accomplish by through synergy of the two uh, could be uh, scary, could be um, intimidating, but I think by learning how to use them, how to program them, and how to use them for our purposes uh, and making sure we are on top of the, their utility as tools and uh, actually keep us on ahead of the game. With that, thank you for your attention and I would like to welcome your questions. I will go. So um, if you have to use 10 qubits to encode one bit securely, why would you use a quantum computer when you can just use a normal computer and have oh, and use like and like do it more efficiently? Big question. <laughs> and that's my son <laughs> putting me on the spot. Right. So um, clearly, yes. to represent just one bit of information, that was not an efficient thing. But also with First of all, with classical computers too, do error corrections. Error correction is done through introducing redundancy. That's how engineering works. Make something secure and happen for sure, you introduce redundancies. Classical bits, um, there are RAMs that are error corrected, which means you use more bits, classical bits, to represent one bit of information. Classical error correction is much easier. You just have to do majority rule. You have six classical bits, and if they're supposed to represent up and one of them goes through an error, you just count that one because it's a minority. You can just do this by addition. 
and averaging. With quantum bits, it's harder. So not only that it is not easier, but also it does not save you from any error or actually make it harder. Why would you use quantum computers, right? So there are reasons to use quantum computers because um, oftentimes the systems that we want to understand are inherently quantum mechanical, especially their dynamics. How the state changes with time is very much quantum mechanical and trying to simulate that with classical computers is near impossible. So there are tasks, plus quantum computers are not going to replace classical computers. But there are certain tasks that quantum computers would be better suited for. And there are other reasons why we would like to use quantum computers um, other than dynamics. But um, if this idea of dynamics um, caught your attention, there's another lecture coming up uh, where there's going to be a lot of discussions about dynamics. We can go into more at home. <laughs> What's about networks? Uh, uh -huh. There is a word that, or I've read uh, maybe in uh, not very technical papers that networks, maybe even wide area networks of quantum computers are natively secure because they, they could have a real time, uh, not only error checking, but security checking via detection of Heisenberg interference on you know an outside uh, source. Uh, potentially intruding on the network. So the question is, is that true? And number two, what is the state of that research? And, and where does machine lear learning, if at all, have, have a role in that? Oh, there were three questions. The first had to do with um, security of the network. So uh, perhaps maybe one um, way to address that might be the long distance entanglement. Yeah. So we had six qubits entangled, but if you can put qubits in an entangled state, that entanglement may not rely on them being right next to each other. So if one qubit is in Chicago and another qubit is in Aspen, and if they are in an entangled state, uh, that might be a way for you to have extra security. Now, um, to do this uh, in real life, we need to be able to couple qubits that are far apart. That is, you need to network. And the challenge is that working would um, inevitably work through electromagnetic waves, through photons. So there is going to be always this interface. How do you have a quantum interconnect is a very big and important research area. How do you go from a qubit in, in one location, couple that with photons, and make that qubit talk to another qubit far away? Uh, progress is being made. Um, whether machine learning has a role to play there, I'm not sure. So um, perhaps one thing that I want to make clear is that machine learning is not a, a tool that is always necessarily useful. And per, um, I thought about whether to talk about the third piece of research or not today, uh, which didn't have anything to do with machine learning. But I also wanted to kind of show how uh, machine learning for me and many physicists are uh, often not an end goal. It's just a tool. It's now in our toolbox that we can use. It's kind of like, you know, maybe you had hand crank drill. You went to Home Depot and got a power drill, a lot of bits, and you get excited. Maybe I can do things with this. Um, not, it's not always going to be that machine learning is useful. There's also a different branch of research where people are trying to see what kind of machine learning you can do with quantum machines. It's called quantum machine learning. That's a totally different area. Hope that answered your question. Yes. Um, in your talk, you talked a lot about the discoveries in physics that have happened over the last hundred years. With yes. Computers being a room now being a tiny little chip. Um, are there any discoveries in the next hundred years that you would get excited about or that you foresee? Oh, um, you know, um, Discoveries or realizations or gaining new insight is always exciting. Um, when I was little, I thought about what do I want to study? I always wanted to be a scientist. And I thought about different scales. And I thought this scale of sort of in the middle, not astronomical, but not very small would be interesting because we can sort of, it's kind of like almost we can know what's going on, but not quite. It's mysterious. 
if the electrons and um, these our fundamental particle, our microscopic constituents follow simple rules, but it scales really badly, we cannot keep track of them and we cannot always know, which means there can always be surprises. And that possibility of surprises that are guaranteed is what I think keeps us really excited. I don't know what new discovery would occur tomorrow, but even just last couple of years, there were really exciting discoveries in new type of um, uh, material settings, such as uh, twisted bilayer graphene, Moray systems, and so on. There's in, in um, huge degree of richness. And if you think about how rich uh, in information the Library of Congress, right? And a piece of material also can hold, in a way, there can be that much going on, and it's, it's really rich. That's one aspect of it. Another aspect that um, is really exciting to me right now is that when I was learning quantum mechanics as a student, as a college student, um, uh, sophomore, junior year, uh, we learned about this third girl like experiment that I told you today, 1922. And everything we learned during that year's course was done in 1920s. And we thought, I felt like, oh my God, I'm born way too late, mm -hmm. right? Only if I was born in 1920, what these people did seems so easy, right? Of course, it wouldn't have been easy because they didn't know as much as we do. They didn't have the formalism and the language and tools. However, I felt like I was born too late. I no longer think that because um, these quantum simulators becoming available means we get to be really hands-on about quantum mechanics. I thought really hard about the six qubit UHD states that I demonstrated today because I was working with data from IBM. So I think it's a really exciting time, not because quantum computer is going to come to your laptop tomorrow and solve all the world's problems, but because it's providing us with a platform to explore and experiment and learn deeper. I hope that, that answered your question. Anybody has a short question? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should answer short. <laughs> yes. Uh, have you been following the news on the room temperature semiconductors and things like that? Conductor. Conductor. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yes. I, 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 I didn't know about whether to talk about that as a possible discovery. If there is a true discovery of that confirmed discovery of room temperature superconductor, that could be also a really surprising discovery. Uh, there is a report of a room temperature phenomena that is one subset of phenomena that a superconductor has to exhibit. And there is all the, uh, there is a, a huge race among many researchers trying to understand this better. And some of my colleagues were discussing this just this afternoon. There will be a whole discussion session on Friday. And if that's confirmed, it will be really exciting. And even if you find it not to be the case, it's going to really um, energize a lot of